To understand where we will be going in the future, I believe it's important to review where we have been in the past. And I'll begin with the advent um, uh, prior to PSA testing. Because pr prostate cancer produces no symptoms until it's too far advanced to cure, prior to the availability of PSA testing, most men had advanced disease at the time of diagnosis, and for this reason, there was a nihilistic approach to the management of localized disease. During this era, William Willett Whitmore brilliantly enunciated his concerns with this iconic statement, is cure possible when necessary, and necessary when possible. And it was absolutely the mantra uh, for every person who felt that prostate cancer, you couldn't do anything about it. And sadly, in the PSA era, he was largely correct in the pre-PSA era. Cure was not necessary because at diagnosis, most men were older, were often ill, and death from cardiovascular disease was most likely. And cure was not possible because most patients at the time of diagnosis had large asymptomatic, a, a large symptomatic palpable lesions. And those few patients who were curable had insignificant T1A disease that did not require treatment. However, for men who did not die of the disease within 15 years of diagnosis, half of them eventually did. And I want you to keep that number in mind. For men who lived 15 years, half of them died from prostate cancer. So here we see the inexorable increase in deaths from prostate cancer uh, uh, going up and culminating prior to 1990 when PSA screening became available. And to sort of punctuate this in a very personal way, the two major leader, leaders in the field of prostate cancer at that time died from the disease. Willett Whitmore, advocate of watchful waiting, developed prostate cancer, took his own advice, and died at age 76. Hugh Jewett, the advocate of radical prostatectomy, was diagnosed with prostate cancer when he was 85 from a palpable lesion and died within a year with no response to hormonal therapy. Where would we be today if our major leaders were falling over from this disease? <coughs> so now I'm going to take the second era, which I've defined arbitrarily between 1990 and 2007. So there's a great controversy over the value of PSA testing. We have a diverse audience here that knows everything more than I know about it and some people who only know what they read in the paper, and that is it doesn't work. Well, I'm going to sort of try to hit a few high points on this controversy that I hope are informative. Does PSA testing save lives? Absolutely. <coughs> Look at this observation. PSA testing comes on board in 1990. Look at the dramatic decline in age-adjusted death rates in US men. As clinicians, we all see it. In 1990, 68% of men who presented with the diagnosis of prostate cancer had, quotes, localized disease. But if you operated on those men, only 25% of them really had curable disease. And 21% of men at the time of diagnosis had metastases. Today, 91% of people have clinically localized disease. It's pretty clinically localized. And only 4%, one out of 25, rather than one out of five, has metastatic disease. So I think this is unequivocal evidence that PSA is valuable. In the past, before PSA testing, men with prostate cancer were diagnosed with incurable disease. With the advent of PSA testing, most men today are diagnosed with curable disease. Thus today, men have a choice that they never had before. They can undergo testing, and if they have cancer, treat, choose treatment or observation, or they can do nothing and run the risk of having a diagnosis when it's too late to cure. Now, I think of all the slides I'm, well, I got one other slide, I like more than this one, but this is a very informative slide. So, uh, on the left, we can see, um, uh, we can see the uh, stage-specific incidence of localized disease, and with PSA testing, there was this uh, vast number of men with asymptomatic uh, disease in the population uh, that over a period of uh, less than half a decade sort of was diagnosed, and then there was uh, sort of a plateau for a period of time. But the most important thing to look at is the age, is the stage-specific incidence of distant metastases. So if you want to know whether any testing is working, all you need to do is to see if that begins to fall. That fell more than 50% with the association of PSA testing. 
So I think more than any other argument you want to use, this clearly shows uh, that PSA testing is effective. Now this is a, st this is a study from Ruth Etzioni's group. In, in the dark uh, colors, you can see what we've been looking at, the observed decline in death rates. And then the, they, she modeled it in the presence or absence of PSA testing, both using the University of Michigan and Fred Hutchinson um, uh, uh, databases. And, and they indicated between 45 and 70 percent of the decrease in prostate cancer mortality can be explained by the stage shift produced by screening. And to sort of put a final punctuation, here we take a look at mortality increase and decreased for all cancer in men and women for the next decade, 1993 to 2003, and you can see the greatest decline in mortality for any cancer was prostate cancer. Now let's go to 2008 to the present when we see reduced PSA screening. In 2008, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force said do not screen for prostate cancer in men 75 and older. And in 2012, they recommended against all PSA-based screening for everyone. Now, why were these decisions made? Well, I could give an hour talk on the flawed analysis. But for those of you who are not, you don't live and breathe this every day, the, the trial that was the negative randomized trial, the PLCO, 90% of the controls had PSA testing. So it was a little more PSA testing versus a little less PSA testing. And there should be no surprise that after 10 years, there was no decrease in mortality. But since that was included as a negative. But more importantly, to really um, understand it, it was actually the point of view. Does PSA testing save lives? The answer is yes and no. Can PSA testing do more harm than good? And the answer is yes and no. So what is the difference? It is the viewpoint. Where the public health viewpoint is, PSA screening refers to population. Every man in this room should have PSA testing. I think many of us as clinicians think about it from a patient care standpoint where the word PSA testing, not screening, refers to individuals. Now the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force guidelines took the public health approach, looking at population testing, and did not separate the value of screening from the side effects of treatment. And these, these recommendations were based on the premise that the current practice of widespread testing is doing more harm than good because of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And as an advocate for PSA testing, I can see that. And the American Urological Association guidelines, which were you know, uh, crafted under the direction of Val Carter, who's my associate, you know, that, that took the same approach. And we cannot ignore uh, that that is an absolute criticism of them. But here's what's happened. Number of new cases of prostate cancer uh, from 2011 to now has fallen 80,000. And David Penson, who's in the audience, has said that for every decline in new cases by 33,500, it is estimated that there will be an increase in prostate cancer deaths by 1,240 per year. Now he goes on to say, uh, you know, when will we see this effect on mortality? The increase in prostate cancer mortality associated with this uh, 2012 decrease in screening is unlikely to be detected for another 10 years, 2022. So is there a canary uh, in the coal mine? What precedes death? Metastases. And this is a great article, I think it's great, that Jim Hugh published uh, in December in JAMA Oncology, where they looked at over a million men diagnosed with prostate cancer in the SEER database between 2004 and 2013. And noted that since 2011, in men greater than 75, remember the recommendations against screening over age 75 were made in 2008, there has been a significant increase in, in metastases at the time of diagnosis. And he raised the question, is this related to that recommendation? So here again, we see um, stage-specific uh, incidence of metastatic disease, which was declining to about 2011 and then there is a significant increase. And again, in men, in men under the age, and, and, and in men um, over the age of 75, in men under the age of 75, it wasn't seen yet. And again, percent of men 
greater than 75 with metastases at diagnosis in 2004, it was 6.6%, it's now 12%. Percent of men greater than 75 with at least an 8 to 10 disease, it was 24%, it's now um, 36%. So with that background, what is the future? Now, there was some good news. I think everyone was kind of celebrating, at least I was, you know, uh, after the sort of the first decade of PSA screening, we see death rates falling markedly. Uh, and that sounded great. But then there was this article or this presentation that said, despite a decline in death rates, there is going to be an increase in the number of men who are going to die from prostate cancer, and that may triple. So where did that come from? That came from June Chan, who's a professor of epidemiology at UCSF. So she published this or, or presented this in the early 2000s. She looked at the, um, the SEER data through 2000. And based on these observations, she projected that despite declining death rates, the number of men dying from prostate cancer will increase dramatically over the next several decades. So why would this occur? It's all based upon the demographics, and that is prostate cancer occurs at a late age in life. Here you see the age-specific probability of a diagnosis uh, in, um, of breast cancer, which intersects with prostate cancer at age 60. And of course, prostate cancer has one of the highest uh, age-specific uh, incidences of any cancer. So although death rate may be falling, if there are more older men in a specific population that is growing, then there will be more total deaths. And why are there more older men? Men are living longer. Now this is my favorite slide. Uh, this is um, looking at cause of death in men uh, under age 85, between 1975 and 2004. Deaths from cardiovascular disease fell 50%. And in the year 2000, Cancer deaths from all causes were the number one cause of men uh, 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 under the age of 85. I read the obituaries every day. I don't know if you do that. I look for my name in there. Walsh, no, he's not there yet. Okay. Uh, and um, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, an awful lot of deaths from cancer in there in, in older people. And why is that important? Well, it's important because the change in life expectancy. Now, this was from improvements in prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. So what happened is life expectancy for white men increased from 69 to 76, for black men from 64 to 73. Why is that important? Because the average age of death for men from prostate cancer is 80. So today, more men are living long enough to die from the disease. <clears throat> now, no one seems to comment much about this, but look at the accelerating increase in death from prostate cancer during this interval from 1975 on. So I told you that half of men who lived 15 years died from the disease in the pre-PSA era. And if more of those men were living longer because they weren't dying of heart disease, they died from prostate cancer. That's exactly what happened to Dr. Jewett. And where would we be today? You know, the American Cancer Society makes slides like this, so I figured I'd put that in here. I mean, where along this line would we be today if it hadn't been for PSA testing and effective treatment? The second reason there are, are going to be more, there are more men is that because of the influence of the baby boomers who were born after World War II. And finally, and most importantly, when prostate cancer is diagnosed in older men, it is more likely to be high risk, just the opposite of what people believed for years. Half of the deaths from prostate cancer in the United States occur in men diagnosed after the age of 74 despite the fact that they represent only 26% of the population. So we have more men at the age where they're likely to die who are going to live long enough to die who, when diagnosed with prostate cancer, has the kind of cancer that kills you. So as a result, over the next 30 years, the number of prostate cancer deaths may triple, exceeding deaths from breast cancer. Worse yet, if the recommendations against PSA testing are widely accepted, the number of deaths from cancer could exceed that estimate by 50%. So what is the future? There is every reason to expect that the number of men who will die from prostate cancer over the next 30 years may increase dramatically unless we are able to prevent the disease or cure it better with fewer side effects. So as we begin this meeting, 
This sober prediction is an important reminder for all of us, stressing the urgent need for breakthroughs in the field. Thank you very much.